start the welcoming now. So thank you everyone for coming to the second reading in our spring 2021 season of the Community and World Literary Series. We're so delighted, my co-curator Francesca Lovato and I are so delighted to welcome two brilliant and innovative writers who are both pushing the boundaries of literature and who are both officially the farthest flung visiting writers we have ever welcomed in this series, thanks to the magic of Zoom. Keek is currently in Bellingham, Washington, where he has recently begun teaching as an assistant professor in Western Washington University's MFA program in creative writing. And Megan is joining us from the future, nine hours ahead of us in the Netherlands, where she lives and works as a writer, editor, and translator. I am especially proud to host today's reading because I just happen to have the good fortune um, to be an editor and publisher of both of our distinguished visiting writers with my press 1913. Megan's stunning first book, Mongrel Tongue, uh, was selected as winner of the 1913 prize and Keek's second book, uh, his first collection of poems titled Disintegration Made Plain and Easy is forthcoming from 1913 press. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Keek who will read first, I'll read his introduction. And then after Keek's read, after Keek reads, I will introduce Megan. And at the end, we'll have a Q and A and discussion with both writers. So if you have a question or a comment, um, that will be the time to raise your virtual hand or type into the chat or try to get mine or Courtney's attention so that we can field your questions. Um, okay, here we go. Keek, Araki Kawaguchi's first book, which I have here, The Book of Cain and Margaret, is a novel about two teenage lovers who disrupt a World War II internment camp in Arizona. It was selected as winner of FC2's Ronald Stuknik Innovative Fiction Prize and published in 2020. Jeff Vandermeer says, Araki Kawaguchi's book of Cain and Margaret is an important book and a brilliant one. Surreal, moving, and beautifully written. One of my favorite reads of this or any year. Salvador Placencia writes of the work, a wondrous trance, one of those novels that defies the rules to make its own indelible order. Araki Kawaguchi's debut is a virtuosic performance of sentences and empathy. Fable, history, slapstick, and a riotous lament, the book of Cain and Margaret contains it all. Anne Vandermeer calls the book a dazzling debut from an important new writer, highly imaginative, bittersweet, astonishing, playful and yet also poignant. And Lucy Corin calls the book of Cain and Margaret ravaging a magical tale of a family shaped by internment, a necessary document of human and narrative inventiveness an abundance of astonishments, harrowing, coy, joyful, audacious, wise, loving, true. It is not just a great debut, it's a great book. I, Sandra Dollar, will just say that I agree with all the good press. <laughs> I will also add that Keek is a writer and human of uncommon capacity. He possesses a generosity on the page and in spirit that makes everything he writes a collaboration with an imagined, unidealized, imperfect reader. His work is an invitation to participate, to admit fault, to become more human. Keek Araki Kawaguchi was many times a community college student, twice a transfer student, twice an undergrad, once an experimental college student, and twice a grad student before figuring out what he wanted to be as a grown up. Keek is currently an assistant professor at Western Washington University, and he is the author of Disintegration Made Plain and Easy, which is forthcoming from 1913 Press. He insists he doesn't have expertise on much, but he is excited to talk with CSUSM writers and artists about first year and transfer student transitions, creative writing practice, submitting work for publication, grad school prep, and grad school survival. Please welcome a literary superhero, Keek Araki Kawaguchi. Thank you, Sandra. What an introduction. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Megan, thank you, San Marcos faculty and students for coming and um, giving us your energy and attention um, for giving this reading a home. And um, so I'm going to read a few things. And uh, actually, maybe I'll go ahead and try this screen share. Here we go. I'll bring us up here. Here's one of the covers for disintegration that's coming up. Uh, so this first thing is like an attempt to write a sleep story. So I don't know if you've heard of this 
genre. It's um, it's like the genre of writing that's meant to be uh, like peaceful and even free of conflict and and boring, and so that you can sort of like listen to it and fall asleep to it. So I tried to write one, but my mind immediately went to like what are the most terrifying things imaginable to me. And so that's kind of what this poem is ended up being about. Uh, so it's called Sleep Story. Uh, these, these images were created by Gautam Rangan, who's a really uh, incredible artist and um, developed some illustrations both for Disintegration and then my, my book of fiction too. Sleep Story. Men have two fears. The first is crashing your hang glider into the center of the ocean at 1 a.m. and having to swim around naked for hours until a shark hears you splashing. The other fear is living forever after everyone is dead, especially after our sun implodes. And every day you are just waving your arms and drifting by Mars in eye bulgy agony, like Arnold Schwarzenegger in that unforgettable movie, Kindergarten Cop. Seeing this aloud, I suppose these fears are exactly the same, which makes sense because men so rarely have differences, afraid of being lonely and also the dark. Even the dark is just a physical representation of a man's loneliness. It spills out of him, the black dew of a melon hacked at its waist. I do not know why I must hang light nakedly I suppose because the more naked you are, the closer you can get to the sun. Uh, this next one, I was thinking of my favorite TV character ever, uh, which is uh, Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. And if you don't know Ron Swanson, he's like, like a really like manly man, uh, stoic, uh, bearded woodworker. Um, like I was trying to think like what would, Ron Swanson poetry sound like, uh, like so probably so like minimalist and clear and masculine and like maybe even sexy. And um, so anyhow, even though I'm like the opposite of man as Ron Swanson, you can, you can pretend um, he's reading this to you. It's called, I like my hunger. I like my hunger. I put it on everything, the butt of bread, the brandy wine tomatoes. Living is a language of hunger. I want to make love to a man. No, not a man exactly, but I want to make love to something extremely hairy. A wolf then, my hunger recognizes the hunger in a wolf. Maybe we do not have to make love. I could simply feed him all the bread I can find. How far will he go before losing consciousness or is somehow immobilized from too many breads? I like to cook a family of birds in their own fat and a country of olives in their own juices. I like Montmorency cherries. I like tart. My mouth goes alive with the word in my mouth. But back to my wolf, what do you do once he is perfectly still from all that bread? I suppose then you could make love to him or you could cook him up. The stuffing is already stuffed down in there. His liver like a fire gods to be spread across my tongue. The woods are deep and plentiful near my house. There is warm blooded fare. There are lovers. The sorrel erupts and jubilates. I kiss everything beneath the sour cherries. Uh, this next one's a love poem. So as you might imagine, it's, it, it's pretty weird. And um, it comes from this line that I heard in like movies and TV. And it's this line where like, like a creepy guy will like come up to a woman and he'll say this. He'll say, um, if you were mine, I would not share you with anyone. And I think it's meant to be a compliment. But when you think about it, it's like this very scary thing to say to someone. <laughs> Like if, it's usually the signal to the audience that, um, you know, like something is not right with this person and uh, you have a healthy relationship, you should be able to share your partner's time with so many people. And so um, anyhow, it's to be wary of someone who, who says this to you. It's called, if, if you were mine. 
If you were mine, I would not share you with anyone, not ruby or even pearl. I would not even share you with a mouse. I would burn this mouse of yours, burn off his fat and drink down the melted fat like a hot butter, the color of his blood. I would not share you with a fishmonger or with a palm reader. Both of your palms belong on my butt, rubbing the soft fat of my butt up and down, somebody rubbing softened butter upon a chicken. I will kill any man who sees your butt or even if he looks at your shadow, which is sort of performance art about your butt being the sunless mirror of your body. But back to the fishmonger, if he touches your hand when handling you a fish, I will strangle this monger man and then I will strangle all his fish. Okay, let's see. Uh, so I had uh, this book of fiction come out last year called The Book of Keen and Margaret. And uh, it, there are many Keens, many Margarets, some old, uh, some young, some have wings, some have magical insects. And uh, uh, in this particular chapter, Keen's like this sort of local celebrity. Uh, uh, lots, of, lots of people are trying to marry. And uh, for part of the chapter, Keen lives like in a small farming town where uh, the Japanese family farms are uh, all like really competitive with each other. And so all these girls are trying to uh, seduce Cain with uh, fresh organic produce. And um, I've never gotten to read this aloud before, but uh, I've always wanted to. So thank you for listening. It's from a chapter called The uh, Absence of an Ocean. It was said that during his youth, Cain was offered 28 proposals of marriage. The first dozen or so occurred during the years he attended high school and later when he studied aeronautical engineering at the local community college. An admirer summoning their courage might approach him and say, uh, Kane, last week I watched you buying some cucumbers and I thought you would very much enjoy this 15 pound sack of cucumbers I picked this morning. And Kane would say, thank you, Mary, or thank you, Emiko, or thank you, Rie, or Haki, that was so kind of you. Would you like to sit and eat a few of them together? Oh, they would say, unable to keep the elation spreading like fever across their face. That, that would be very, very nice. And later, while the firm melon green flesh broke between their teeth, the tart glassy seed bodies and the mild cucumber perfumed water sluiced over their lips, they would say, yeah, my family is big in this area when it comes to cucumbers. You could visit the farm to pick and take home whatever you like. And Keen would say, gosh, thanks so much, Seiko, or gosh, Chio, or it's a kind offer, Evelyn, though I think I'll likely be all right for cucumbers, at least for a little while. Yep, they would say any person who marries into my family can eat all the cucumbers they can handle, all the pickles they want to. It sounds like they'd be getting a good deal, Keen would say. All the strawberry and cucumber salad, all the mint and cucumber cocktails, all the cucumber and cream cheese sandwiches. I only have to marry into my family. The man would be set for cucumbers for life. They would have to marry into your family, Keen would say, his butt cheeks scooching a bit away from Sugar or Kimmy or Betty. Uh, they couldn't just be close friends. Friends are all right, they would say, dating, uh, sure, going steady, but eventually a girl thinks to herself, surely it seems like this person is getting more than their fair share of cucumbers without ever making a decent commitment. Friendship is not a commitment? Well, there's that saying, you can only date the cow so long before you must marry the cow, and then the cow will turn into a princess. No one ever told me that version. And then she would say, do you ever think about getting hitched, Kane? I'm waiting for the right person. You know, I'm the same way. Sometimes I think I'm looking for just the right cucumber. Green, but not too much green. It can't be boring with its greenishness. It has to be a bit of a yellow coat, like a small outburst of yellow. You understand what I'm saying? I think I'm following long, but then not too long. Not so long, it seems it got its longness only to be showing off. 
plump, but not too much plump either. It can't be some kind of an unusual fatso cucumber. Can you hear what I'm telling you? I didn't realize those traits changed the flavor of a cucumber. Sometimes the right cucumber, well, it was staring you in the face the whole time, staring right in your face, buddy. You just needed to look down and realize you'd already picked it. You had been holding it in your hands. And that was when one of these Santa Maria girls would reach down and take Kane by the hand. And then they would say, so what do you think? Oh, it's great. I'm, I'm learning tons about cucumbers today. Right, okay, that's a start. But do you think you've already picked it? Picked what? The, the one you were looking for. I can't be sure. Didn't you pick these for me? And then they would say, I'd like to do this again, Kane. I'm, I'm available. Do you understand what I'm telling you when I say I'm available? Oh, we'll see each other again soon. We could see each other every morning, nighttime too. You wouldn't need to see anyone else. Oh, I'm going to need a little time to get back to you on that one, Kane would say. I feel as though the two of us understand each other on this higher level. We resonate with each other. Uh, what do you call them up in the bell tower? We match like those. A lot of couples won't get the chance at something like it. When you have a feeling like that, you have to say it out loud. You have to act on it loudly, don't you think? Uh, do you feel better now that you've said it? I do, she would say. I feel complete. Chimes, is that what they call them? So it went for the daughters of Central Coast farming families of lettuce, tomatoes, yellow squash, avocados, artichokes, pumpkins, grapes, blackberries, huckleberries, strawberries. Keen became expert in pickling and making preserves. In their kitchen, Hamako Araki would help him process the flats of berries, the pillowcases bulging with artichokes. The two of them worked shoulder to shoulder, swiping roots and tops off their cutting boards, measuring pectin, pouring sugar, working a wooden spoon through a steaming and ever thickening pot. Seems like you found another admirer, Hamako would say, someone trying to plead their case. What did you think? Was she pretty? Uh, she really was very pretty, Keen would say, lowering his ear to a pumpkin and wrapping it with his knuckles. All right, you don't sound really very excited. Do you want me to get married soon? How badly do you want me out of your house? How badly do you want to leave? Not at all. So stay then. What do I need an extra room for? Look at the free salads we eat. You think I should be taking it more seriously? That is not my advice. Do you feel like being serious? I can be serious, but no one makes me feel that way. All right, so then why buy the cow, right? What's that? Well, there's the saying about a cow. You don't have to buy her because she's like got so many cows in the pasture and they're all basically have the same stupid cow face and terrible breath. So why worry if one cow runs away? She probably can't run very fast anyhow. Well, I didn't realize the saying went in that direction. Right, well, maybe you don't enjoy cows. Maybe you want a donkey or like some camels. But most of the time I'm into people. Right, well, that's good enough, Hamako would say, but you had still probably better deliver some jam and cookies back to her family. They'll spread rumors that we're rude if you don't. Okay, well, I'll read this last one. Thank you all for listening. Uh, this one's about my favorite uh, comic book character <laughs> and kind of meditating on his superpowers, um, but also sort of thinking about what would be like the mutant inverse of his powers. Um, so this is called a skeleton of glass and marmalade. Wolverine's superpowers are healing the physical fleshy type wounds very good, but he sucks big time at healing emotional wounds. Try saying a small thing about Jean Grey near that keen dog-like hearing. Two modes, either he air punches the motherfucking Christ out of the sky with his Santoku knife hands and turns his tank top into a clingy pungent confetti, or gets all silent walks briskly to the nearest bar and murders like eight and a half bikers. And I say one half since there's always one in the gang who hasn't saved up to buy his own bike. So less a biker and more a man who enjoys hugging his friends upon their bikes. The point is Weapon X murders that poor dude too. He's touchy as hell. Maybe you do not even say Jean Grey. Maybe, damn, look at Scott there in his new gray jeans. Wish I had gray jeans from JCPenney's. 
outcome, the adamantium fist kebabs, another microbrewery covered floor to ceiling in the blood and terror pee of frat boys. I wouldn't have my Wolverine any other way though. Given the spectrum of mutant abilities, you know there's another Wolverine out there in Portland or San Francisco who's the mutant inversion of Logan McClawface. And probably this other Wolverine is very, very mature, well-adjusted man with Kleenex tissue for skin. And his girlfriend dumps him, but they remain best friends until she marries one of his coworkers, maybe his boss from Cheesecake Factory. Then they organically drift apart, only remaining friends by Facebook, where he comments on photos of her children. They look so much like his boss. And then at the ripe age of 28, one of his crocheting hooks pricks his thumb and the skin of his hand falls from bone like rotten leaves and his muscles fall past his knees like rotten leaves and his hair and teeth come out of his head like rotten fucking leaves and his cock dehydrates and faints and tumbles over his balls and snaps off and hits the carpet with a dry thud. And he bleeds to death mid reach for a bandaid. His skeleton of glass and marmalade disintegrating, falling across the unfinished crocheted lap blanket. Because this Wolverine, pleasant party guest Wolverine, always complained of a persistent chilly lap he did. Oh, my lap is so chilly, he would say, because my legs are not hairy at all. And no, I would want, not want that constellation at superpowers. Good at emotions, but terrible at living. Thank you. Yay, there's lots of clapping going on that you can't hear right now. I'm sorry, Keith, but we'll we'll do our inaudible claps, thumb snaps. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. And thank you for um, reading a piece you've never read aloud before too. That's really wonderful to hear that and um, to entrust us with that experience. Beautiful. Um, excellent. So, um, I'm already thinking of so many things we can talk about. So we'll, we'll get to our next writer, um, Megan Jimenez, who I'm delighted to introduce to you now. Megan Jimenez's first book, Mongrel Tongue, right here, I just so happen to have, um, was selected by the National Book Award winner, Daniel Borzetsky, um, as winner of the 1913 prize for first books. This collection of prose poems and hybrid text pursues what is left out of the official history, the movie version, the news account, the branding campaign, Latin Americans exiled in surreal landscapes, women on the lam from the eternal feminine and people awake to the breakdown of the general narrative take shape in monologues, interviews, fractured fairy tales and alternative histories. A mongrel tongue is a language like English made up of words imposed by borrowed, inherited, pilfered, and misheard from many different languages. A mongrel tongue is a language of the mixed up descendants of the colonized, the crimson lipped feminized, the weepy survivors of a fevered nostalgia and hybrid beasts of the deep. We turn to a mongrel tongue when the stories we've been told have calcified into media narratives, advertising, and purebred political campaigns. And we wish to write another story whose ending is yet unknown. Daniel Borzutsky says, quote, with lyrical brilliance and discipline, Megan Jimenez's mongrel tongue swerves through the many ways we live with and among disaster. The narratives here are boundless. Everywhere there's a body searching for home, a political exile, a climate refugee, a body that's absorbed, a body that refuses to be absorbed, a body that refuses to disappear into history. I'm thrilled by the vibrancy of this debut, by the words it creates amid worlds that make us vanish." End quote. Fanny Howe calls the pieces half stories from a fully experienced observer peering out at the light that brings her the news. The new world is here still being discovered by a woman we recognize by her likeness to another woman we don't recognize. A hilarious and prophetic book that is tragic at heart. Shanna Compton writes, eschewing purity of all kinds, the prose poems and hybrid pieces in mongrel tongue call themselves novel, document, story, tale, interview, history, invocation. 
This startling book revels in the translator's gulf, nomadically moving through the clutter of the world, offering slippages and valences galore. As her editor and publisher, I, Sandra Dollar, will add that Megan is the kind of writer you find by accident, the sort whose work sidles up on top of a pile of contest manuscripts, doing work that changes the terms of our work. I was looking for a writer like Megan until I realized she'd been there all along, working her materials, sharpening a form, defying genre and expectation, always and already phenomenal. Megan Jimenez is a translator and writer. Her first book, Mongrel Tongue, is a collection of prose poems and hybrid texts. was published by 1913 Press in 2019. Megan is originally from Venezuela, grew up in Denver, and studied at the New School in New York. She has worked as a diner waitress, office drone, copywriter for the Victoria's Secret catalog, textbook proofreader, and translator at the United Nations. Her poems and fiction have appeared in Barrel House, Denver Quarterly, the Kenyan Review and other journals. Megan is a flash fiction editor for Split Lip Magazine and teaches with the Amsterdam-based International Writers Collective. She currently works as an editor for international organizations and lives in Leiden, the Netherlands with her husband and cat. Please welcome a literary maven, Megan Jimenez. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. That was amazing. Um, I'm really touched. And um, it was funny that that ended with the word cat after all those other words. Um, so yes, thank you for hosting me. And thanks to Courtney and Francesco and everybody else who made this possible. And thank you all out there for being there. I wish I, I could see all of your faces at once. But um, thank you. Thank you for coming. And thanks to Keek for that beautiful reading. And I wish also that you could have heard people laughing because I'm sure I'm sure people were, I was, <laughs> with, with the last piece, especially. Um, all right, so this is the first time I've done a reading on Zoom, and I have to confess that, that when this confinement we're in first started, I had mixed feelings about online events, but a year on, it gets a little bit lonely, and it's actually really amazing that we can all converge in this space. <laughs> That's nowhere, but across uh, time zones and continents, so I'm, I'm really grateful. Uh, so I'm going to share some poems from the book uh, from Mongrel Tongue and also a couple of, of new things. And I wrote the book over several years and I wasn't consciously writing a book at first, um, but when I started to look at the poems together, I realized that I was interested in the idea of a story so how we're taught that there's a certain order and a shape to a story beginning in childhood with fairy tales or religious texts. And I was thinking about the kind of expectation that creates. Um, and I was also thinking about how these ideas and expectations of a story are used and often abused by advertising, by media, by politics, like we talk about political narratives or media narratives. And how does this shape all of our own expectations and impressions of really complicated events like climate change or even a relationship? Uh, and lastly, I was interested in how poetry subverts these expectations of what a narrative should do and how poetry can turn a cliche on its side. So I'm gonna read a few of the poems where I was playing around with all these questions about stories. Um, and I like to know I personally like to know what a poem looks like when I hear it. And I know this is the perfect chance to share an image of it, but I, I felt like I was gonna screw up the tech and also get nervous with everyone reading along. So I will just say that they're prose poems, meaning that there's no line breaks and they look like nice little square paragraphs. Um, so yes, if you wanna picture something, I think it's also nice just to listen to. So this one is called Novel. In the beginning, I was a wolf watching the girl in the woods. I was lost in the woods. I blew the house. I was taking a beautiful woman by her soft shoulders and kissing her. He took me by the shoulders and kissed me. I was a man terrified in a rough new uniform. I promised to write him every day. I was a man chatting with the barkeep, laughing at the whores dancing. 
I did a shoulder shimmy for the shoulder for the soldiers. I was taking, I went ahead and did it because a man has to be a man after all. He can't go around apologizing for his needs all the time. I was driving too fast. I told him to slow down. I was damn sorry, pleading on my knees to a beautiful woman. I felt I could never forgive him for what he had done. I was smoking my last cigarette when the goddamn typewriter ribbon broke. He never showed me the end of the story. This is a lone story. His life had been unresentful thus far. Born into a healthy family, he had had a crappy childhood, attended the beef schools, and was expected to be successful, marry hell, and have a family of his owing, perhaps go into politics if all went according to placebo. But then, a few years into his lard practice, he met her. It was loins at first night. Her smallest gesture sent charity all over his body. He couldn't meet, he couldn't weep. Her piercing blue thighs, her sultry tips, her svelte sinecure taunted his thoughts from the moment he first saw her. But they were doodled from the beginning. Some passions churn so hot, they conceal themselves and everything else along with them. And there was the small mating of her husband. That hot human night, they had just separated from a rational coming together when they heard a lost bang outside. Sterile, came the shout from below. Sterile, that's what I'll, you'll be when I'm through with you. Her husband was in the yard, waving a grub in the air. This is a reader's guide to exile and it's in three numbered parts. One, we've been fed that story before. In fact, we are morbidly obese from the stories we've been fed. We can just barely make it to the movies from the stories we've been fed. We can hardly get out of bed from the stories we've been fed. We seek new flavors on television. We sit on the couch, we eat them up. Or else we lie in bed, we don't even have to get up. Supplies are running low. Our dreams don't do it. We're dying in bed, anemic. Two, in our waking life, we can fly. We fly across oceans. We discover lands. In our waking life, babies are born from a lack of sex. It never gets dark. In our waking life, there is nothing so large, we haven't calculated it. There's nothing so small, we can't imagine it. There's nothing we can't do. We look down at the earth from the stars. In our waking life, we're playing with fire, we're heroes. We're out there getting what we want. Three, in our dreams, we were pulling something green from the earth, brushing away the crumbling soil. We were taking an animal with supreme gentleness into, into our arms. In our dreams, there's an earth to inherit and somehow the meek to inherit it. In our dreams, we were watching a beloved dying in our bed. We had to watch her body leave the house. In our dreams, there is blood. In our dreams, we were wasting our time daydreaming. And this is the flood, the flood. <laughs> How could a flood be destroying anything when there are heart-shaped chocolate boxes to be opened with delight? Reclining chairs, mechanical pencils and their tiny replacement erasers, light bulbs of varying wattage, their filigree coils sheltered in frosted glass, Charm bracelets would not exist in a climate of disaster, nor would there be such long lasting paper money graced with engravings of our nation's heroes. 7,000 varieties of apples, personalized birthday cakes, time release sleeping pills. 
what could be made of a word like refugee when to work is to christen shades of lipstick in a tall building every day. First love pink, caramel glacé. There could not possibly be an end to multicolored Christmas lights, road trips across the continent, a summer house on the shore. Food is nothing less than a branch of philosophy when encyclopedia sets lovingly printed in the era of paper are left out with the recycling. If it gets too warm, there is rice paper with which to powder your nose, hairpins with rhinestones on their fine ends, dream journals, the perfect macchiato, mechanical escalators and fly swatters, historical preservation societies, guidebooks to a long and satisfying sex life. So I love readings when the poet reads new work, and it was fun to hear something that hadn't been read out loud from Keek, um, or work in progress, and it because it feels like a little bonus treat for showing up. And I think the work often has a different energy around it, probably because of the way the poet's feeling about it, um, which is maybe not even really sure what it is yet. Uh, so I'm gonna be brave and end with a couple of new poems. These are not published. And about them, I'll say that probably like many of you, I spend many of my waking hours on the internet, just taking it all in. Uh, masses of words, tabs open, links, articles, Twitter feeds, news feeds. And I'm not forced to do it, but I'm somehow compelled to. And because so much of it is words, it's inevitably made language feel different. And um, in terms of my writing, it's, it's made it more simple and direct, I think, and it's an attempt to hear myself cutting through all of it. And I think become interested in what it's like to be just an eye wandering around in this uh, world. Um, and as far as the form, these are kind of the opposite. They're long, skinny poems with short lines. And I think also just because I was trying to make some space for the words. Um, okay, about this one, I should say that it's it's a kind of conversation with just a, a short quote by Muriel, the po poet Muriel Rokeyser, and it's in italics, but since I can't read italics or I don't want to do a weird voice, <laughs> I don't want to do a weird voice for them, I will just say that it's Muriel when I quote her. It's called The Society for Decision Making Under Deep Uncertainty, which is an actual organization that's studying climate climate change, <laughs> the Society for Decision-Making Under Deep Uncertainty. January, 2020. New York is full of desire for money if you don't have it, for everything else if you do. I buy a perfume on Union Square at the farmer's market, cider donuts, farm-raised turkeys, lachinazzo kale. The bookstores have magazines on photography and biodynamic wine. In Brooklyn, we step over sidewalk Christmas trees. I stroke a copper-colored 100% alpaca coat. There are bodegas with $10 cheeses, bottled drinks by the hundreds in soft tones. Muriel. Faith is found here, not in a destiny raiding and parceling out knowledge and the earth, but in a people who person by person, believes in itself. I'm in Lisbon next, surrounded by tourist cat, magnets, tote bags, keychains, menus in five languages. It's trying to take a picture, hungry for their piece of it, not wanting it to get away. It is the view, the angle of light, a ruffle of wind on the sea, birds in a plaza. I'm not exempt. I don't like the way I turn away after I've taken a photo of a site dismissively as if I don't need to look anymore because I've captured it, but I haven't. And what are all these pictures for? They're single use plastic, yogurt cups, lady razors, water bottles, ice cream spoons. Muriel, do you accept your own gestures and symbols? 
I buy creamy wool gloves made by a woman women's cooperative at an anti-capitalist store. 17 euros for absolution, a day after reading about the fashion industry's greenhouse gas emissions. In the Portuguese Chinatown, I'm tempted by the glow-in-the-dark Virgin Marys staring out a store window, all in a row, factory made. Muriel, when you act, do you believe what you are doing? Back home, I watch Dutch TV. The interviewee says he's not worried. This is the only country with a plan to deal with the greatest possible flood, he says, a one in 10,000 year flood. Muriel, do you believe what you yourself have to say? And I will end with a poem called Escape Plan. At one point, this was after several years together, you said, not everything is sad. We don't have to make everything sad. <laughs> it was funny, but it was also serious. There's no need to be the anxious children of single mothers every day. The moms are fine. They've gone on to play bridge daily, get season tickets to the ballet and have plans for an Alaskan cruise. But some things are clearly sad, which is why I didn't want to go to the Atlantic City Aquarium. The words Atlantic City Aquarium were already a clear warning. The trip became inevitable, however, with the dawning of a rainy day, a restless nephew, I didn't want to have to write about the big moray eel jammed in between rocks in a glass box, unable to turn around, the little tropical sharks subject to endless stroking by grubby hands, or the noble faced sea turtle swimming in circles in another too small box. In my mind, I made an escape plan for him, the noble turtle, into the endless ocean. We broke into the aquarium, then released him, or else the aquarium staff has this plan for him someday, I thought they must. Thinking this relieved my pain for him, the noble turtle, but did nothing for him. These benevolent intentions have got to find a better form, some living shape in the world, nation. It's not enough to think about a day when we'll all get together again, a room for everyone in the country house, all of us so lovely and not thinking of money or anything ending. We'll stay up very, very late. And in the morning, we'll have pancakes for breakfast. Thank you. <laughs> wow, that was really, really beautiful and wonderful. And thank you for entrusting us with your work and your work in progress. That was fantastic. Um, I love the mention of Muriel in, in lieu of an italics voice. So that, was, that worked really well. I'm, I, I can't figure out how to unmute everyone. So, I mean, I think I could, but <laughs> for applause, maybe by the end, I'll figure this out. We'll unmute everyone at the end for a big round of applause for Keek and Megan. Um, yay. <laughs> and now I think we can move into Q&A discussion. Um, I know there, there's been some um, chat in the, in the sidebar, in the chat, um, some thanks, some um, new poems rock, thank you. <laughs> thank you for sharing um, and people posting their gratitude. So thanks everyone for posting. And if folks have um, questions or comments, um, now's the time that we, can, that we can kind of chat for a few minutes before people have to take off, so. Yeah, any, um, Courtney, I don't know if you are, are seeing any, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, and maybe Courtney can keep an eye on hands raised if people have hands raised. Um, I feel so lucky to have you both I'd here. Like so to... to... <laughs> oh, good, yeah, someone? Yes, for Keek, um, I noticed that you mentioned butts a lot and I appreciate that because I love butts. Where's this coming from? Where are you? Oh, is this Christine? Hi. <laughs> is that Christine Christine? Sylvester. Yeah. Oh, okay. So there's a comment for you. Right. My, um, my, former, my former husband didn't have much of a butt, so I was a little disappointed. But, but. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Yeah, I, um, 
<laughs> yeah, th there's a lot of repetition of the butts in that one poem. And um, I don't know, I don't know what the things are in poems that make, you know, um, the, make me feel as a reader, like I sometimes know the poet a little bit, but sometimes it's that, <laughs> like sometimes it's, um, it's just some like funny quirk or some vulgarity that um, they haven't edited out. And um, thank, anyhow, thank you for that comment, Christine. Yeah, thanks for that comment. <laughs> That's a good, so if anyone's nervous about commenting or asking a question, I think we, I think we just broke the ice there. So thank you for that. Um, there's a comment, I appreciate the poetry so much. Um, easy to resonate and connect with. Um, and then here's a question in the chat. I'll just read it out. Um, and um, that will be how we'll do this. Um, I'll read this out. And then if other people you know, want to raise your hand, Courtney can unmute you for a question after this. Ms. Jimenez, your poem, Reader's Guide to Exile. Um, this is from John Wielden. Can you elaborate on the lines about becoming overfed on stories? Is this about information overload? Do you think that we are so enveloped in narratives that they eventually lose their meaning? Or is the poem about something else? Great question. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, you're definitely touching on a lot of what I was thinking about, especially the first part that you referenced. I think I was thinking about, and I I should say, I don't mean this to sound like judgment of anyone because I think we're all in it together. I mean, I do it too, but this kind of like the binging on Netflix becoming just a thing that everybody does. And I was thinking about all these different like all these different narratives coming at us at the same time when before we used to have, as, as a culture, used to have a kind of leading one that, that, that brought everyone together or that, I don't know, shaped, shaped the sort of direction. And now it's, it's a thousand different things at once. So yeah, it's definitely media, uh, sorry, information overload, as you mentioned. Uh, the other two parts are sort of contrasting it where the second one was this heroic view of everything we're doing is great and it's this kind of great quest that we're on which is that that hero's journey right and then the last one was kind of turning to our dream life as a way to figure out our own story like the way that our dreams are private symbols and um not necessarily linear and not I mean, I, I think it's 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 less scary maybe than than whatever else is coming at us. I don't know for me at least. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that was my question, by the way. I uh, that's really insightful. I feel like I know people who watch every show all the time, and I'm kind of the kind of, I'm the kind of person who wants to watch a show and really like sink my teeth into it. So every time somebody's like, "Oh, you got to check this out," it's always a long process because it's like I need to like get familiar with it because it's important. So like, I just started watching Dexter, which is awesome, but yeah. Thank you for your feedback. Yeah, thank you. I know I feel the same way. And I'm always, I also feel like you gotta really commit. You can't just be dabbling in all these things, <laughs> but I feel like that's okay now. But I, I don't know, I feel really old fashioned where I'm like, I, really, I, I started this, I need to commit to it, <laughs> see it through. But yeah, it's a, I think it's a different way of, well, and even the word consuming, I think that we use now. I saw people talking about this, like we say consume art when I don't think that used to be the word we use. Yeah. Yeah, great point. Um, Laura, I see your hand up. Do you want to unmute and ask a question? Yeah, Keith, this is for you. Are you a foodie? I don't, I don't know. That's maybe. <laughs> well, no, you, you have a lot of food references in your, in what you read to us today. And I was just wondering, if you're a foodie, uh, what foods do you gravitate toward? Oh, wow, what a fun, what a fun question. That question is more fun than the poems, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I am, I don't know much about food. I'm kind of like a unpicky eater, but I'll eat like almost any, anything. And my, like my greatest fantasy, when I go to sleep at night, the fantasy that I could think about forever is going to a buffet and being able to eat forever without getting sick. Um, I, I've heard this actually like kind of a common fantasy, but um, so I have that. And what would I eat at the buffet? I would eat like um, like fried chicken and waffles probably forever. <laughs> and, but, um, but yeah, I think, um, I don't know how it gets into the poems, you know, like I, 
um, I think part of like there's a whole layer of my poetry that's just like how can I um, uh, like like where is the layer of entertainment going to come from so that the reader is just willing to stick with me for another couple of lines and I feel like sometimes if I can just put in something that's a little bit delicious to me and and to someone else maybe you'll stick around thank you for that question well, that's great I noticed food in both um, I'm trying to you know kind of think about connections between so that's really um interesting um I think there's a question in the chat that I'll read out from Alexis Miser what would you say is the message behind skeleton of glass marmalade of glass and marmalade um so sort of not food related but <laughs> <laughs> when there's marmalade so yeah that's the uh, the wolverine poem I um I don't know where a lot of this comes from to be honest but I was thinking about like I was just kind of doing some self-reflection and thinking about why Wolverine is is like my favorite superhero. Like why is my favorite like the comic book character I'm most obsessed with? And like um, what are the qualities that um, I'm so fascinated by? And um, uh, and like really question like really having to question like um, like what are my values <laughs> because I love Wolverine so much because he's this he's this person who um is totally invulnerable like to attack right like you he can be like take a bullet to the head and the bullet will like work its way out of his skull and so he's totally impervious but any like little emotional thing will like totally set him off <laughs> and i don't but i also think like it's a really brilliant like brilliantly conceived of character like this idea of like a macho man or something like that, who's like so far on the other side, like totally impervious to attack, but totally like um, like any little bit of emotion is just, will just like um, implode uh, everything. And um, so I, I don't know the message other than it's like some kind of uh, exploration of um, like what that person is, what it says about what it says about my values. And I suppose because of the popularity of Wolverine and the X-Men, what it says about all of us who, who love him. I have maybe a related question that both of you could maybe speak to that might that, um, satisfy my own curiosity, but also um, some of our students I know. So, um, you know, in terms of persona or um, who is speaking in a poem, you know, it was really interesting to look at the ways that you're both kind of um, collaborating with other voices, um, specifically, you know, Miriam Rockheiser, but also, um, you know, Keek, you, you give some background where you're kind of speaking for uh, someone else or, you know, a character from Parks and Rec, like that's their, that's their poem. So um, who do you envision? And I think this is something our students think about in their writing, like, is the poet <laughs> always speaking? Is the poem always you? Um, and if not, then who is speaking in, in your work? Either of you, both of you. Okay, so um, I, this is something I've always thought about. And I think for me, it was always really scary to write as I, and it's something I'm more comfortable doing now. But I think also because I'm not worried about people saying, oh, that's you, which I think used to be my fear saying this thing on the page, that's you, that's you forever. Whereas I think it's, um, even if it is, if, even if it is me, it's kind of like an outfit I put on and was feeling that day or a uh, costume or something like a, yeah, a certain attitude. Um, so yes, it's not always me. And then sometimes in the in the book, some of the poems I read in the book, the eyes is not me at all. It's this kind of naive perspective I was taking on of, of personifying like a certain attitude or something. Yeah. I, it's a really fun question. I, um, I mean, my default answer is always, I don't know, but, um, but Sandra's partner, Ben Dollar, who's also uh, an amazing poet said, this to me, he's, he's one of my teachers, which is that so much of art making, almost all of art making is just a channeling of anxieties. And um, I, when I heard that, I wrote it like on every notebook for like two years. 
And um, that's kind of what I feel like the voice in a lot of my work is, is just like my anxiety speaking really big. And um, like poetry is this way that like of having something I feel anxious or insecure about, but, um, but it's almost like um, channeled through the voice of like an NBA basketball player at their press conference where it's said very confidently. And so I, I feel like that's the voice. It's a mixture of these two things, like, like crushing, staggering anxiety, and then also like, a, like perfect, uh, profound confidence, you know, somehow mixed together. And um, I feel like if I have any strength as a poet, it's somehow just that I have probably a lot of the same anxieties that a lot of people do. Um, Great, great answers. We could we could talk all day about that. <laughs> Why we write, how we write, what we're channeling, and who. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. There's any other questions or comments? Um, there's a comment in the chat from John. Um, I like your description of being eternal and eventually seeing the sun explode and then just floating around in space forever. I've thought of that idea before. Um, Thank you, John, for sharing that, um, that that resonated with you. That's something that poems can do. <laughs> you know, we have um, visiting writers from far away and they're reading us these words and we're like, wait a second, I've had that, I've had that dream or I've had that thought. Um, other, other questions or comments while we have our distinguished writers with us? How did you both feel um, reading the the newer, or Megan reading your new piece and Keek reading something that you hadn't read before? Is there an element of um, kind of nervousness that is there on Zoom that wouldn't be there in person or vice versa? Maybe in Zoom, we don't get instant reactions. So it's harder to tell, harder to read the room maybe, but. It was funny. It sort of practicing reading it out loud before which I hadn't made me edit it and really get it into a different shape or them but then the first one I was like oh this is actually just like the flood one I just read <laughs> I'm actually not writing that differently <laughs> was what suddenly dawned on me that the, the similarities to the older work I, I hadn't really seen it but it seemed obvious this kind of listing of of stuff stuff in the world and what that does in a in a little pile I think I noticed that I was like, oh, I'm still doing that. <laughs> yeah, which is not a bad thing. That's a great thing that you do. Yeah, I, I feel like Megan said it so well before she was, or during her reading, which is like reading new work feels really exciting. And like, hopefully the listeners, um, you know, get gather some of that energy. And um, I just, I feel like this might be a um, another thing I share with, some of the writers here maybe is like after writing something I feel like I hate it for a long time <laughs> after I feel like it's done and um and there's something about writing something like fresh that you feel like no one has seen before it likes like it's like bringing someone like fresh bread or something like that and um there's an excitement uh, to it so I'm I'm nervous for every reading but um I, th I also did have a little bit of excitement to read something I, I hadn't done before Great, thanks you both. I think um, I think we um, we can hang out. People are kind of taking off because I know pe some people have class and meetings and things. Um, if folks want to unmute and give a round of applause before we go, and then we can continue to hang out for a few minutes if the writers have time. So um, I'll lead the round of applause if people want to actually applaud. Thank you so much. So we have some sense of the of the, uh, the number of people who were here. There were so many um, people. Thank you so much to everyone who came out. And I think we'll have kind of a dwindling group now if people want to chat and just unmute. Um, uh, Keek and, and Megan, I don't know if you can hang out for just a couple more minutes. Um, sure, yeah. Cool. Yeah, uh, Megan, I, I wanted to, if I could please respond, not, I don't have any questions. I just want to, I was very moved by a few of the lines that you shared that um, I wrote down. Um, his life had been unresentful, amazing, 
Um, he can't go around apologizing for his needs all the time. Just some, so much of what you wrote spoke to me. I have a whole page full of, <laughs> of things that I quickly jotted down that just were super, super powerful. I think you're an amazing writer. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing <laughs> that. Yeah, and the word substitution piece, um, I feel like I... Um, my students were just doing that. So I'm so glad that, that that was, that was read aloud, but some of them really hit so, so true. Yeah. Is there any way I can get, um, sent a recording of this meeting to my email? Courtney, I think we can do that. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll have the uh, recording posted on our website. And if you want to email me directly, I can send it to you via email as well. I'll put my email in the chat right now. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, Courtney. That reminds me I'm going to stop recording right now. So. <laughs>